So here's the upfront question. What should we fight about? Yeah, because he gets into a bit of a boxing match almost, doesn't it? And don't you think that's fascinating as a starting point? Because you sort of like, um, in, in, in my mind, the best thing is always not to fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best thing is always to find a nice, peaceable solution. Um, everybody can be friends. Yeah. Um, smooth things over. And uh, Paul's like, no, there's some stuff. We're going to fight, man. Like, come oh, on. Yeah. I'm going to fight you on this. Uh, oppose some people to their face. <laughs> <laughs> in front of in front of a public, in front of a whole crowd of people. Yeah. Uh, so um, we we see. I mean, we, you know, through through history and even looking around now, we. I mean, it is possible to fight over silly things, isn't it? Yeah. So um, I don't know uh, if you know the joke, and I don't know how relevant it is these <laughs> days. But um, you know, sort of the it the, the Southern Baptists in America uh, would have the Southern Baptist uh, pre millennials. Uh, which is to do with sort of what they think is going to happen at the end of the yeah. world. Um, uh, millennium would happen, which would be Jesus will return. He'll rule over the earth for a thousand years. And they think this weird idea, which I must say I find uh, lots of people believe in, yeah. but I don't see where it is in the Bible, uh, of this idea of a rapture where the church will get whisked off somewhere, not sure where, um, bef- before the millennium or after the millennium or in the middle of the millennium or there won't be a millennium, or um, there won't be a rapture, or there won't... And so they, they, <laughs> the idea is you walk down the street, and like every church has got their own, you know, like, sign above their door, <laughs> we're pre-trib. No, we're really going, <laughs> oh, we're post-trib. We're really going, oh, we're, we're mid-trib. Uh, but with a... But we're, <laughs> but with a millennium. And, you know, like, every single one has a sign on the door. Yeah. And um, none of them talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> And I think we all agree that's not the best stuff to fight over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can uh, you can have some fights over, you know, position of the organ. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sadly, that's only funny because it's so true. Yeah. Apparently, the way to get around that is move it one inch every week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and over the decades, yeah. you uh, you get there. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can have fights in, into uh, who has the right title. Yeah. Um, so, Pastor Andy, or. <laughs> Associate Pastor Andy, or senior associate to the vice president. Yeah, a few a few people at English school call me sir. Do they I feel like maybe we should <laughs> widen that out a little Happily, bit? Sir. Happily, sir. <laughs> um, so we kind of it's easy when it's not you to laugh sure. at what somebody yeah. else ju- uh, fights about. But Paul actually says we should fight over some stuff, like really mm. fight over it. Doesn't he talk about wanting to cast? <laughs> I think he says he, he wants them to do it themselves. <laughs> That's um, one of the bits I've been reading in front of my mum. So shall we read a verse just to <laughs> yeah. give us, Let's so you know what this. we're talking about? Let's get into this. Uh, I think it's chapter one, isn't it? Yeah. So I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Wow. It's so strong, isn't it? I think if if anybody said half of this... I'd be like, reach it, like, just, mate, just sit down, like, just calm, <laughs> calm yourself down before yeah. you speak. Yeah. And um, the truth is that Paul could be as calm as anybody could ever get him, mm. and he'd still say it. Yeah. Yeah. Because he thinks there's some stuff you should fight over. Yeah. And it seems to be, well, I think it's, it, it kind of pretty obviously jumps out, it's... If somebody or a group or a teaching arises, that changes the gospel. Mm. So, I don't know, can we pull out any... I mean, um, in the letter, in the situation that he was speaking to, um, there's a lot in the letter, isn't there, about um, adding or continuing in works of the law to be saved rather than receiving it by faith. That's the big issue he's speaking into is he not? Yeah, I mean, so 
uh, when I went to university, mm. um, there was there was lots of groups where you had to sign a doctrinal statement yeah. to be allowed to lead them or speak at them or whatever. <laughs> and and that was all good intent and great, you know, in a way, brilliant, like yeah. wonderful. Um, but I think what it missed was that most false teaching you spot by what what it produces in the people who follow it what they do more than what they would say they believe and that's probably okay. that's probably got even more true now where to be honest most of us would say yeah i'll just sign that mm-hmm. no problem yeah. but that doesn't mean that what we're going to teach people will lead them to live a life like jesus we can have we can walk around and say, hey, I'm a great preacher. Look how many people follow me. Look how many people are making commitments mm-hmm. to Jesus based on my preaching. Uh, but when you actually look at what they're doing, they're producing people who are not looking like Jesus. They may say they're Christians and they may say they've made a commitment, but are they living more like Jesus? Mm-hmm. And that is the test for Paul. Like The church in Galatia, he's, he's most concerned that they're starting to live in a right. way that doesn't look like a Christian community. So does that go back to, you know, the, is that kind of application of the teaching of Jesus, you judge a tree by its fruit? It must be that, mustn't it? And so he's basically saying, look, the fruit's bad, therefore something in the tree must be wrong. Mm. This is what's wrong. I yeah. see it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so the thing that he does with Peter, which you already referenced, is, is Peter? No, it's not Peter. Is yeah. it Peter? Yeah. Getting confused. He calls him Cephas in this book, doesn't mm. he? Um, he? He starts to separate off in the church those who are Jewish following Jewish law and they eat together and those who don't follow Jewish law aren't allowed to sit at the same table as them. They have to sit at a different table. Mm. And Paul looks at that. He doesn't. It's not a doctrine question. It's not yeah. like in the middle of a preach that's wrong doctrine. It's He looks at what's happening and he stands up and he's like, I oppose you to your face what you're doing is totally wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so he sees the fruit of it. And so it separates the church. Anything that separates the church uh, that Jesus has called his own is ultimately something that Paul would oppose. Yeah. So strangely enough, he would walk down that road in the Southern Baptists mm. and he'd actually say, you're all wrong. Yeah. You're separating the church on something that Jesus does not separate it on. Yeah. So that's kind of an it, you know, uh, those those extreme Americans example. But we we get false teaching closer to home, don't we, in terms of producing fruit, which is not the kind that Jesus is looking to produce in His church. So, what are some of the things we should watch out for? Yeah. So it's always dangerous, isn't it? Because we generalise and then we can kind of tar people with a brush. It's the easiest thing to do in the world, and um, I don't want to do that. But I think there's three different things that you can look for that you just would make you think, hold on a minute, is this the gospel of Jesus Christ that's being preached? Yeah. The first one is, uh, is the person preaching about money in a way that makes you look down on the poor? It, are they preaching about money in the way that makes people aspire in their life to owning nicer more expensive cars bigger houses and to live a lot more luxurious lifestyle now i want to be really careful how we say that it's not that anybody wanting those things is necessarily wrong but do they preach into that do they make you go away thinking oh i need to get a higher paid job or i I, you know i I don't want to spend time with that guy look he, he only works he only works as a cleaner uh, and if anything like that, then what that is, is um, is probably quite dangerous because mm. the gospel of Jesus Christ lifts up the poor and actually says that if you're rich, you're no better than the poor. So if you, does that make sense? Yeah. So that's one, which people might sometimes call prosperity gospel. Uh, and you want to be really careful of that. If when you're listening to a sermon, you're feeling like, oh, I need to be rich or if I'm rich, I'm superior to the poor, switch it off. So it's the it's the pride and the heart that it cultivates rather than a particular um, philosophy on money. Yeah, I think because the the kingdom is a kingdom of abundance, mm. 
And there's many biblical promises of God giving us all we need and his generous God. So we don't want to just sort of say, oh, they're talking about money, leave it. It's if the, if what they say ultimately creates in you greed mm. and a dismissal of people who are poor or you just don't want to really be around them very much. They just yeah. So it's like to use the pizza with the Jews and Gentiles argument. It's almost like if you're looking at people and they're beginning to eat at a different table based on wealth rather than rather than eating together that would be a fruit of brilliant prosperity gospel like red flag red flag this is a different gospel to the one paul preached the one jesus gave brilliant way to put it yeah brilliant way to put it uh so if the people who only ever share stories who ever brought up on stage or celebrities or people who have you know doing in a human terms successfully in life mm. yeah red flag yeah uh, the second one uh would be people who feel like they preach in a way that makes you criticise the church. Right. Um, and what you'll notice, and even me saying this is a bit... <laughs> how do you talk, I don't know how you say this, but uh, the reality is some people, when they preach, they preach in a way that basically suggests the church is, you know, they're not really faithful, they're impure, God is going to judge all of the church, and we are the ones who are doing mm. it right. Yeah. And if anybody starts making you think, hey, I'm in the right group and all the rest of them are, they're just not the real deal, that's a red flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's similar to that uh, street with the different theologies on the millennium, but, you know, it's always just that thought of, you know, the, 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 the odds that we... <laughs> <laughs> in the UK in the, in 2022 are finally the ones that after all of church history have suddenly managed to get it right on every issue. Yeah. I mean, the odds are low. <laughs> the odds are low for you, sir. <laughs> but, you know, we. I mean, honestly, some people just need to take themselves a bit less seriously. That's yeah. what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. And as soon as your gospel makes you take yourself so seriously, I'm it. Mm. And those guys are the infidel or the sinners or the lukewarm or the lackluster. And you, you create a divide between yourself and them. And you're off. That's mm. a different gospel. Yeah. The gospel that we preach is, yeah, there are lukewarm people. Yeah. We love them. We embrace them. We say, I mean, Paul over and over stresses to the naughtiest churches you know, you were called by the Lord. He's He wants you. We embrace you. We draw you in. Yeah. So it's nothing wrong with pointing out you guys aren't living like this. Or it's not that that's the problem. It's that it then becomes the way that you separate. Yeah. You you use a label to push them away. And yeah. That's that's never the that's never the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And again, we can use the table thing, can't we? I mean, if if it's causing people to eat at a table that's only there for the spiritually mature. Yeah. I mean, that's just so contrary to Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Who took a, who ate with the tax collectors and the sinners? Yeah. Red flag. Okay, there's one more, isn't there? Uh, so, um, if if you hear somebody preaching, and it leaves you thinking, God doesn't really care. I mean, does really God care that much what I do in my bedroom? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't God big enough and loving enough? He really. We're going to pretend that God gets uptight about. You know, if I just do a bit of stuff with my genitals, like, what's the big problem? If you go there and you end up uh, it, where you just notice people, they just swear quite a lot. They just seem to not really mind about getting drunk or even doing drugs or... I mean, it's, you know, there's all a bit of greed, a bit of selfishness, a bit of whatever the... I mean, it's always similar mm. things, to be honest, isn't it? But yeah. if, if you... if if you're listening to somebody and you just notice that, then it's a red flag mm. because God's a holy God. He calls us to form ourselves into the likeness of Jesus. And that means we're kind to the poor. It means we care about forgiveness and love. But it means that we also must live lives of holiness. So this doesn't so much tend to separate a table from a table because often people who live this kind of gospel will say to everybody, hey, come sit at our table. Mm. But the table is a table that isn't feasting on the banquets of the kingdom. Mm. And that's the challenge. Yeah. And, um... and so 
It's like there's no call to repentance. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And you just want to be careful of that because um, we're called to lay down the life that we did live. I've been crucified with Christ and the world has been crucified to me, Paul says, I think, at the end of Galatians. So there's a sense that I've laid something down, I've ended that and I've begun in repentance a new way of living, which is the Christ formed way of living Mm. and if that's not happening it's not the gospel of jesus christ and it's it's so interesting i mean because jesus is like super clear he uses that commandment beware of false teachers Mm. it's so rarely i've so rarely heard people teach on that but it was like a like a standard part of the curriculum for jesus it's like Mm. there's something you need to be wary of there are Wolves mm. who are going to devour you if you if you take them in. Paul says the same to the church elders in Ephesus. You know, wolves are going to come in among you. Mm. This is a this is a thing that we're going to have to look out for. False teaching is stuff that you will have to recognize, mm. and they don't come and say <laughs> false teacher. Mm. It sounds great. It sounds great, but for me, that's been super helpful to think. Hey. What is the fruit that, that is this is producing? Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, maybe we're speaking against ourselves a little bit here, but it's a, it's a wariness about um, disembodied teaching, mm. online teaching. I mean, if you only see us on the YouTube, you have no idea, really, what the fruit of what we're doing produces. Um, and for most of these guys um, who are famous online i've no idea what what the family looks like what the local church body looks like what the fruit of their teaching is Mm -hmm. and so it's really difficult to spot false teaching and i think it's what we'd encourage you it's not against disembodied ministry from a distance you know paul was writing a letter there's use for use for it it's powerful but it you don't want to put too much trust in someone who you can't see behind the curtain yeah you really don't. It's brilliant, Andy. It's brilliant. Um, so, shall we just capture, just to get a bit of the like, the guts out of this? So, we've tried to paint for you the big picture. Let's just get some of these real guts bits out of Galatians because some of this stuff is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I'm going to throw some verses at you. Yeah. So, we've yeah. got, um, oh, this is great. And it's, uh, I almost want to, uh, I'm not going to say it's a vineyard one, but it, it, it's one that touches on some of the theology that we hold really dear. Uh, 1 verse 4, um, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Uh, I mean, even just that those little three words, present evil age, there's so much to that, isn't there? Oh, amazing. And I think, you know, we could go into that. I could talk about this for, <laughs> for days and often do. Uh, but the thing that what Paul is saying is that you lived in and we do live in an age, like a way of the world, a way of being, which is evil. Mm. The strength of that word should shock us. Mm. He's not saying everything about it is bad because the creation is good. He's a creationist. He believes mm. that, not not the new type of creationist, mm. He's a cre- he believes God created all things. It's inherently good and has fallen and has been infected and corrupted and now is ruled over by what, something he only describes as evil. evil yeah. And so what he basically says is, we must, as the church, be different from how everybody else lives. Mm. And so the question to you is, do you pride yourself on being like everybody else? Mm. Or do you have a desire to live different from how everybody else lives who doesn't know Jesus? Yeah. And the gospel produces the need to live differently from how everybody else lives. And that can be manifested in many different ways. You don't have to dress weird or talk weird, mm. but you should act weird. Yeah. You should turn the other cheek when somebody insults yeah. you. You should refuse to gossip. You should just be up front and plain. You should care for the poor. You should. It doesn't mean other people don't do these things, but the combination of all these things together yeah. is a strange way to live. And we talked about that yeah. in the previous few weeks. Yeah. Brilliant. Let's jump forward to uh, chapter 2. I'm going to read from 11 to 16. It's one bit that we've already referenced. When Cephas, or Peter, came to, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face 
because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are, not, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. I don't know how much power that has today, but it really should have power, because what Paul is basically saying is there's no second-class Christians. Like we are, if we have Jesus and we have faith in Jesus, we are one. We cannot start creating class systems and hierarchies. Mm. We are all legitimately present. So you and we've talked about that already. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually, one of the bits that is really helpful, because this is really only explicitly stated like this so much in Galatians, is what he says at the end of this chapter, when he says, um, All of you who are baptised into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And what he's saying there is not like, oh, you all like one another, but there is, there is no distinction in your superiority, your level, your hierarchy, your access to God, your ability to be filled with the Spirit, your uh, way, the seats you can sit on in church. There's no mm. There's no distinction. Yeah, incredible. I mean, and again, we, we've referenced this a little bit before, but there's strong arguments that the seeds of this, this being a seed, um, actually is the underpinning, the the root of. Um, why our culture today values equality so highly um it's like mm, the vast majority of other cultures at other times around the earth well no it's like strong rules over the week and discard discard the baby on the mm -hmm. side of the, the side of the road if it's not going to serve you what's the big deal you know we could reference other uh, you know 20th century regimes no sense of equality uh, uh, and yet we live in a society now that that wants to mm. equal 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 equal, but we've got the we've got the root. Yeah. <laughs> we've got where this comes from. That was our from. idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, um, Aristotle, I think it was, who said women are born to serve men. Yeah. And uh, black people are born to serve white people. Yeah. And if you move anybody from one of those classes into the other class, you're making a fundamental error against nature. Yeah. I think that's Aristotle. Yeah. And, you know, what? The kingdom is different from that. Yeah. If you are, uh, a lot of talk about women's rights, if you're a woman, the place you get the right, you know, the place you get most dignity and respect and honour and treatment is in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, if a lot of talk about racism. If you are non-white, uh, or in fact, if you are a minority uh, colour, wherever you're watching this in the world, because there's some nations where mm. uh, different uh, uh, ethnic groups are the dominant group, whoever, if you're a minority ethnic group, um, the place where you receive most dignity and honour is in the kingdom of Jesus. Mm. Now, that may not always be represented to you by all the people who claim to be Christians in this moment. They're living a false gospel. Mm. But actually, in the kingdom of Jesus is where you get most honour, dignity, Respect. Yeah. And it, uh, it's a side point, strange comfort for me in, you know, even post resurrection, post acts, Peter and Barnabas, uh, they're not immune from the odd mistake, <laughs> mistake born out of fear. They yeah. get it wrong. Yeah. These giants of the faith, we can often have like the Peter stories happily ever after, after the, the restoration conversation with Jesus. But there's a wrestle and they needed somebody else to oppose them to yeah. their face and yeah. say, come on, guys, this isn't in line yeah. with the gospel. Yeah. Um, we need that. We need that every now and again. Um, and we need to be able to take it, right? Yeah. 
Um, I don't know how I, good I am at that, but I hope if somebody says to me, what you're doing is wrong, mm. I won't return with, what, you know, like, yeah. don't you, either don't you, we don't argue, you know, it's just piece it all down, pretends nothing, or how dare you. Hopefully I'll be like, okay, look, do you know what? Let me embrace that. Mm. Let me embrace this. This is what I think you're saying. Is that right? Yeah. But also, it like, Paul... Paul doesn't say this is wrong according to my opinion. It's like this is not in line with an external reality, the gospel. Mm. So that gives us space to be like, okay, well, let's show me according to how this is in the gospel. Yeah. And if I see that I'm wrong, then there's real grounds for repentance Brilliant. rather than, oh, you don't like it, but uh, I've got somewhere else to go. And yeah. it's so helpful yeah. for relationships, isn't it? Brilliant. That's brilliant, Andy. I feel like we could talk about that some more. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're going to go to 5, 13 to 15. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So um, what should the gospel produce in you? Uh, we've said it should make us different, mm-hmm. different people. It should mean there's no division. We kind of accept everyone as it is. Uh, I, we missed out 3-3, but there's a clear evidence of the Holy Spirit at mm-hmm. work, including miracles. Um, and this one, the if God is with us, if his gospel is really at work in our hearts, it will make us want to lovingly serve one another. We may not enjoy it, we may not, you know, we may think there's, we may not be that good at it, but mm. we want to serve one another in love. And that is really one of the most profound uh, demonstrations that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that you have heard and are living mm. and are believing. Because ultimately the gospel is this, it, it says, I have been let into the kingdom of Jesus, even though I totally don't deserve it. I, I, it's entirely grace that brought me in. It wasn't that God looked around and thought, hey, I want somebody who's a particularly good person, let me bring... No, no. He looked around and he's like, okay, you don't deserve it. Do you want to come in anyway? Mm-hmm. I invite you to come in. So if I really understand that, and think of Jesus' parables on this same thing, then I look around and think, does, I don't ask the question, does Andy deserve to be sat on mm-hmm. this sofa with me? I don't ask the question of, you know, does this person deserve to be in this room or in this church or to have this time? It's not about that. It's like... Grace says, I want to lovingly serve this person because that's how Jesus has treated me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love that. I love that line. Use, use your freedom to serve mm. one another in love. Mm. Like you can do anything you want. <laughs> so the gospel, at one level, you could do whatever, anything. Do whatever you want. So serve one another in love. And that is a real spirit-filled church, actually, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we Paul says a spirit for a church of the gospel. There's a lot about the spirit in Galatians. We haven't talked about, but um, the gospel produces the spirit in you. You live in a certain way. Love your peace, patience, kind of goodness, all that stuff. Um, it you you should see and know the spirit is present, and you should see miracles. But the greatest test of whether somebody is somebody filled with the spirit is, are they somebody? who serves others in love. Yeah. And you can only see that up close. Yeah. You can only see that up close. It's, it's a... It's, it's a something, guide for community flourishing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's something, you know, it, it probably doesn't look great on TikTok. Yeah. Because it's not... Bang, there. You yeah. could do something which is kind of serving, which you put on to, you know, don't do a day where you, who knows what, pick up litter or whatever. And that's good. Like, yeah. But the reality is this is slow and steady work of the Spirit, which this is truly what changes your lives. Yeah. Um, this is truly what will change people's lives. Yeah. Just slow and steady. It never feels like it's really dramatic or viral mm. it won't go viral but this is the kingdom this is this is the kingdom in this age and it's worth fighting for oh yeah so we fight for that 